Um, now, some of the things that I learned later were um, that uh, on June 23rd of, uh, I believe that was 1910, the St. Paul Coal Company pled guilty to nine counts of child labor law violations and was fined a total of $630. And uh, between the mine company and the relief funds, it was determined that each victim's family ultimately received about $3,261.72. Mm. And also um, there were two brothers, uh, Joe and John Bernardini, who were among the last out of the burning mine, who each received the best settlement from the coal company, uh, permanently crippled by their burns, each received $6,500. Now, mining operations in that mine, if you can believe it, actually resumed at the end of 1910. Mm -hmm. and, but the mine was closed again after a strike in 1927. Uh, in 1929, a gentleman by the name of John Bartoli bought the mine property, fixed it up, and began mining coal again. But then again, this production ceased in 1935, in 1934. The mine was then leased for a year, and finally it was closed completely in 1935. Most of this information was from the book by Tintori. Uh, called Trapped. Um, now, it was al already, uh, uh, you heard that the disaster led to the U.S. government creating the U.S. Bureau of Mines in 1910, and the state legislature passed the state's first liability act the following year, allowing uh, the miners and their families to recover damages caused by their employers' negligence. So that's uh, that's about all I can contribute in addition. Rona, yeah. can you uh, can you give us any insight into how those families happened to settle in Highwood? Uh, yeah, I think there are already people here from the same part of Italy. That's my understanding. They were coming from uh, those uh, the two southern uh, provinces down there. And there were already people in Highwood, so they followed them I up. believe so. That's what attracted them, yes. I know there's people here from Highwood and the Highwood Historical Society. If you want to add to that, you're welcome to. Yeah, that's right. Anybody want to speak up? Is, is <laughs> we, Cynthia on, the, on, the, on your list? Cynthia's not here. She had to go to a uh, family event. Oh, okay. I'm actually... I know her family, the Pigotti family you know, did come to Highwood. I don't know the circumstances at the time. We have a book called uh, Houses with Names. And I know it does talk about the Cherry Mine disaster and the families that were involved during during that event. Uh, but I'm not real familiar with it unless I get the book out and, and, and uh, go through it. But um, Rhoda, if you wanna know a little bit more information, I will try to find it for you. Good, thank you. And I believe there was a family I, Lindsay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Hi, <laughs> Rhoda was one of my substitutes when I was teaching long, long ago. <laughs> so Rhoda and everyone else, I understood that was a combination of family and work. People had relatives and family that came from same, the same region, spoke the same dialect, and also there were work opportunities for the widows and for the children actually and um, other people so that was those two things combined just kind of drew a fair amount of people to Highwood and other places and they also went to Michigan and things like that. And I think Lindsay was one of the families I think Lindsay I don't know that and uh, Carteroli I, I guess I mentioned that. My, my father was in the mines but he was in the mines in Kincaid Illinois, which is to the east of uh, Cherry. Oh. And uh, I know when he was talking about being in the mines, he was very uncomfortable and he never, he got out of it as soon as he could. But I still have his little mine card that shows that he was there. And that was one of his 
first jobs when he came from Italy. Now, my family came from northern Italy, not the center of Italy, like the majority of the Highwood people. But I know coal mining was one of the jobs that he did when he came from Italy. Well, thank you, every, thank you all for participating. Oh. Oh, Rhoda, you've got another question. Tell us a little bit about the research that you did for this excellent talk. Very good. Well, um, a lot of it uh, is from, uh, um, th there's a Il Illinois State, uh, what was it that, um, uh, I think I mentioned that in the beginning. It was um, uh, government, the, the inquiry, the inquiry that followed and uh, newspaper. Uh, that that was the report, the report from the Illinois State Board of Commissioners of Labor. Yeah, that's right. There you go. And also, uh, we even had, uh, well, we, we, uh, um, in our newsletter at the museum, we had a, an article on it, which uh, uh, I borrowed from also. And uh, again, we presented this uh, 11 years ago at the uh, Fire Academy. I'm, I'm a little uh, uh, not quite clear on every place where I got this information, but it was basically the Chicago History Museum and the uh, uh, records in the, the Tribune uh, articles and, and from the official mine inquiry. And Basically. Jeff has actually done a series of talks. Cherry Mine is one. He's done uh, at least two on fires from the uh, stockyards. Yeah, the 1910 uh, and the 1934 <laughs> stockyards fire. Uh, a, a fire at the LaSalle Hotel. There was one, uh, a fire at a, a meat packing company, uh, which was in the late 1960s. And it was, if you An don't explosion. mind me saying. Yeah. And what was interesting was the initial report suggested that they poured fuel oil or whatever into the basement. But in fact, when the truck was backing up, it went against a garbage can and slid open, and that's when the fuel poured out. And then, the, but it, it took a explosion. long time for that piece of information to be unveiled, and by that time, the public was no longer interested. He's done the uh, McCormick Place fires, the fire at McCormick Place. He he he's, he does these presentations, and and I've been working with him to make them a more permanent record. Yeah, oh, great. Much appreciated. Yeah. yeah. Jeff, this is uh, Larry Amade, fire chief from Highland Park. Oh yeah, um, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. Um, excellent presentation. Uh, I one thing I wanted to ask you because I can't find a book on him, but former fire commissioner Quinn of Chicago yeah. was supposed to be quite a character, and I he I was. just can't believe there's not a book about him. Do you know much of his history? Oh yes, oh yeah, yeah. He was uh, he was at that 1934. Stockyards fire as a firefighter. I mean, and I, by the way, I knew Corrigan. I was, I became friendly with him in his later years. So, but I, and I kick myself for not asking him because at the time I was still a kid and I, I wasn't aware of all these things he had done. He was an amazing man, Michael J. Corrigan. He was on the first apparatus to the Iroquois theater fire. He was at the Engine 13 on Dearborn and Lake when the stagehand kept knocking on the window, pointing to the theater, the theater, first company in. And he was at the Eastland when after the Eastland turned over, he was working up acetylene torch on the hull of the Eastland, trying to open it up and getting people out. In 1917, he, uh, he was at the opening night of the Opera House as the fireman on watch when a anarchist rolled a lighted uh, bomb down the aisle of the, of the auditorium, ran down, threw his coat over it, snuffed out the fuse and ran it out to the street. I mean, this guy was Jeez. really uh, quite a- Quite a history for one man. You know? Yes, and, and he was the one who, in 1920, uh, uh, no, in 1917, when they went to two shifts, you know, before that, firemen worked six days a week and they were only off one day. 
and he uh, helped uh, persuade Big Bill the Builder, Mayor Thompson, to uh, to get uh, put in a second shift and to have them run operate 24 hours on and 24 hours off. So, uh, I mean, he was, uh, and he was known never to have lost a man at a fire where he was in command, which is remarkable. Um, uh, of course, when there was one fire where he was in charge and he, it was under control, so he turned it over to a deputy. And as he was walking away, the place blew up. But he went back in and personally helped pull out injured firemen. I mean, I mean, he he was not a desk person. He was yeah. a very Did any, yeah. Jeff, and any Quinn, books okay, books you were asking about him. What's that? Is there any books about Corrigan out there? No, and I have been very upset over the years. I've tried to push the brass to name something for him, a, fi a fireboat or something. And of course, uh, you know, there were people who sort of resented him to, to a certain extent because he was from the old school and he wouldn't get metal ladders because he was aerial ladders because he was afraid of hitting wires and having people electrocuted. So he, he ordered sort of older style apparatus for quite a while while he was still in charge. But he was an amazing man. Uh, um, Quinn was amazing too for a lot of different things. <laughs> One of the things was he ordered all Cadillac ambulances for the fire department because <laughs> it was his belief that if you're going to go out, you're going to go out in style. <laughs> that, was his, that, was, uh, that was his theory. But, uh, uh, but he, and he brought in the snorkels, you know, the, uh, the, you know that used to, he got, yes. he got the idea from the cherry pickers that used to uh, change lights uh, on uh, uh, street lamps and things. And they made that into the snorkels that they used for firefighting. Yeah. Is, um, would Corrigan be the longest serving Chicago fireman ever? I can't imagine anybody more than 61 years <laughs> serving on the fire department. Again, uh, in the later years after he was named uh, commissioner. That was a non-uniform position, but technically he was still a, a fireman. And he, if when he went to a fire, he put on his white coat and, and helmet. So he was, uh, you know, still in charge, but uh, not active firefighter. But. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Okay. Right. Jeff, you hey, Jeff. Can do an oral history. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Jeff, of what you know of that guy. <laughs> right. Sorry. Jeff? This is, this is Cynthia Kroll? Yes. Okay, I just wanted, really wanted to thank you. That story oh. about, um, I've always heard the story from my great-grandfather's side, from the survivor side, or being trapped, but I'd never heard it from the firefighter perspective. And it was yes, fascinating. Th thank yeah. you so much for that. Yeah, well, you know what, what, what um, uh, wasn't really said that much was, yes, they went to put out the fire, but they also went to retrieve those bodies. I mean, that, that had to be the most grisly, awful thing that any of them ever had to face. To exactly, and, and what we've them. lost from our family history is like what happened on the second day that they, after they were brought up. Like we, we've never heard that part about the rest, like the resuscitation effort, the, the hospitalization. We, we've never had those details. So oh. that was really nice to hear. Okay, well, again, um, I have to give credit to uh, uh, Karen Tintori's book. It had, a, a, you know, a lot of good stuff in there, which yeah. I've also seen in other places, but, uh, but uh, it was a very good source, very excellent source, which is in the Highland Park Library, if you want to go see it. It's called Trapped, the 1909 Cherry Mine Disaster. There it is by Karen Tintori. And I think the Highwood Historical Society has a copy as well. Yes, yep. there it is. There it is. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, Rhoda. Uh, real quickly. First of all, a uh, very fine job. I very much enjoyed it. Your story about uh, former Chief Quinn saying that uh, he wanted Cadillac ambulances so people could go out in style. <laughs> that was something that was also adopted by the first Mayor Daly. 
and he made it something of a campaign pitch. <laughs> and in fact, um, when he passed, um, and he had a heart attack, he was in the Civic Center. No, he, well, he was in my doctor's office when he, when he had, yeah, I knew about Richard J. Daly, yeah. Right. I was just going to say that it was ironic that they had just begun to phase out the Cadillac ambulances, and when they came to take him when he had that heart attack, he was in one of the first of the modern box-style ambulances. Uh, when they took him away, uh, ambulance number 42, back in, um, what was it, the early 70s, I believe. 1976, it was. I can tell you. 76, was, uh, was it? November, <laughs> yes. I, I, yes. I, I had just been with him on, a, on an L train not long before that when, uh, well, I was, that's another part of my life we don't have to go into. But anyway, uh, <laughs> yes, I will. I will remember. Yeah. Great stories. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Um, I was right. just going to ask oh. one more thing, Jeff, and that yeah. is if uh, I like to do a lot of sightseeing, and uh, that's a very nice part of the state. If I went there, is there any marker or anything marking? I know you, you showed the sign. Uh, yeah, well, Kathy has been there. Kathy, speak up. Okay. <laughs> I've been there. It's unmistakable. There's these two mounds of shale. You drive through Cherry. In fact, uh, I don't know if this woman is here, but uh, she was going to come tonight. She grew up in that area. She grew up in Princeton. And she said as a child, they would drive through Cherry and they would see the mounds and they would all stop talking in the car because they remembered all the people that died there. Yeah. Yeah. And you, you, you can't mistake it, you, you, you know. In fact, I didn't know the, the cherry sign I took because I knew Jeff was doing the talk. But the first time I went there, you know, I was just driving down the road, you know, I didn't know anything. It was like, wow, what's going on here? One, one thing I would add, Rhoda, this is Cynthia Kroll again. Um, the Cherry Museum in town, it's the Cherry Public Library has an extensive collection, everything ever written about, and they have an amazing um, kind of diorama that they had made about 20 years ago. Um, everything that you would need to know about the, the mine is there. And there's also a cemetery, and it's fascinating to see about 250 graves with the same day on them. And oh there's, there's kind of a sweet story. Um, so for the last 100 years, the grade school um, on the day of the, the anniversary, they have the day off of school and the entire school, I mean, it's not that big, but the entire school would march to the cemetery and have a parade and do a whole celebration and just honor, honor the victims. That's great. And then also in Princeton, the Princeton Historical Society, which is about maybe 15 minutes away, it's right off at Route 80 or Interstate 80. Um, they have a huge uh, research center and collection on the Cherry Mine disaster as well. You have made up my mind for me. I'm going to visit. Okay, yeah, it's, Rhoda, it's and when country. you want something to eat out in that part of the country, contact me before. I can give you some advice. But fried chicken. <laughs> All the taverns compete for the best fried chicken. And in a few select places, you can also find uh, turtle. <laughs> and uh, that's, that's a, a relic of the Illinois River people. I'll bet it's a mock turtle. Huh? No, it's the real thing. <laughs> and surprisingly, each piece of meat you try has a different taste. It's not like, it's not uniform. And it's a little animal, a little critter. And it's, in fact, what they do is they fry it and then they braise it, which makes its own gravy, is like they like to tell you. And I think it should have been braised and then fried. But, you know, they didn't ask my opinion. <laughs> there are just just down the road from Cherry in Ladd, there are two places. There's uh, Lanudis and um, Rips, and those are the two that compete for the chicken prize. And they've both been featured in Midwest Living Magazine, and they're wonderful. I grew up in LaSalle about 10 minutes from there. And um, there's also, there, there was a, an effort for a while to. Um, kind of brand that road between 
Oh, only Bonnie says only Rips is still open. Sorry, yeah. well, I've I've <laughs> moved away. I'm in Wisconsin now, but <laughs> um, so so definitely check out Rips in Lad. It's wonderful, and they were trying to rebrand that area uh, Ravioli Alley because what what but Chicagoans call tortellini down in this part of the of Illinois we call them wraps or ravioli. Exactly. Forgot so about definitely that detail. worth checking out but great program you guys this was fascinating okay, okay. thank you for tuning hey. in yeah. but by yeah, the jeff, way would people jeff, oh i'm sorry go ahead oh yeah it, jeff one last thing from larry amity i'd love yeah. to see one uh, uh i'd love to see your presentation on the iroquois theater uh yeah i actually i never did it i i that's oh, one okay. I, it's not I, too I, late yeah, I know. But, you know, we tried to put up a plaque where the Oriental Theater is. That's really about where that um, Iroquois was. And they wouldn't even let us put a plaque up on the 100th anniversary oh, of the fire. Oh they, would, they didn't want anybody even thinking about that in that building. Yeah, because there was, I can't remember, there was a lot of deaths in that one, wasn't there? 602. Women and children. It was a matinee, and um, it was a matinee performance. And the uh, uh, spark from the arc lamp uh, touched the uh, curtain. And uh, you know, what was this? Four Eddie Foy and the seven little Foys <laughs> were on stage. And uh, and you know, the theater. That the irony of that is that fireproof theater. The structure probably was, and it was only six weeks old. It had only opened six weeks before. The, the structure was fireproof, but nothing inside was. They had hemp, <coughs> hemp seats. They had, and they, had, they hadn't finished putting in the fire escapes. And there was stuff that, and there was a, a, a system that would have taken the smoke straight up and out that hadn't been opened yet. And there were terrible, uh, again, but the worst part of that, and which resulted in laws all over the world, was the fact that the exit doors opened inward. And all it took were a few people to fall and all the other people behind couldn't get out or were trampled to death. Uh, it was said that Kaiser Wilhelm closed every theater in Berlin until it could be retrofitted with doors that opened outward. It was a worldwide thing resulted in, from that day forward, every theater had to have doors that opened outward. And, uh, and, and that all came from the Iroquois. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, yeah. So, Thank you. Yeah, okay. Jeff, yeah. this was terrific. Yeah. All right, well. And I told you there would be an interest in this. <laughs> yeah, right. I okay. had to persuade him really hard to, <laughs> or gently, to, to do this talk. Because he said, oh, it's Cherry, Illinois. That's far away. Nobody here would be interested. And I have to say, knowing that the Highwood Historical Society had done a program on the Cherry Hill, that helped persuade him. And then I, we learned that there were Highwood families where this is in their history. That helped. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Okay, everybody. Well, keep tuned in to uh, Kathy puts on these, uh, you know, different programs. And hopefully when we get back to the library, to the auditorium there, it'll be uh, easier to come and, and, you know, watch these programs. They're, they're... Jeff, the Jeff what, is your, uh, what is your next disaster? <laughs> well, I, uh, yeah. We haven't decided yet. We tried to do it on an important anniversary, you know, like that Mickleberry uh, uh, sausage company uh, plant that blew up in 1968. We did that in 19, in 2018, which was the 50th anniversary. And so we try to make it on, you know. Of course, next year is gonna be the big one for the Chicago fire, 150 years next year. So we'll yeah. be doing something, uh, that's for sure. I think there should be a Jeff Stern variation of that talk in any case. 
In yeah. fact, we went, he, Jeff and I attended a talk where it was about the Our Lady of Angels, that school fire from yeah. the late 19. 19- 50s yeah. and he didn't want to touch it because it's such an emotional thing and the people a lot of people are still alive yeah. and we when we went to the talk afterwards he complained well they didn't talk about you know the the fire trucks with the ladders on it and they said that's because it wasn't a jeff stern talk yeah yeah if it was jeff's talk it would have been from the fireman's perspective yeah yeah, yeah. jeff but uh, yeah. Jeff, I gotta I gotta have you come by the station on Central Avenue. Okay. Um, we uh somebody donated uh the front wheels off of the fire, you know, horse drawn wagon from that was a Highland Park, you know, wagon back in uh between nineteen hundred and nineteen ten. And we put them in a real nice glass framed uh, cabinet with oh, yeah. uh something about the, the uh firemen, you know, the Highland Park firemen that donated it. But his uh-huh. grand his grandkids or great grandkids donated it, and it's a it's really beautiful. You you've got to stop by and see it. And I'll show you. You you know what's interesting about uh, a lot about a fire apparatus and firemen, um, the terminology never changes. Do you know that to this day when they go on a a call, it's called going on a run. Do you know that goes back to the days when firemen actually pulled the hose carts by hand. They went, this is before they even had horses pulling them. They went on a run and it's still called a run. Yeah, and the, still called it. the fire plug goes back to the days of wooden water mains and they had to cut them open to uh, put the suction down to draw the water. And when they were finished, they plugged it back up the wooden water main. And when uh, they talk about their apparatus, uh, w- well, which rig are you on? Which rig? That goes back to horse-drawn rigs. And when the chief arrives in his car, uh, you know, one of the battalion chiefs, he's going to make an inspection. Oh, here, here comes the chief's buggy. Well, <laughs> yeah. That's, yeah. That's, that was the chief's buggy from the days yeah. of horse-drawn uh, wagons. So we don't like we don't like change. That's, that's <laughs> yeah, the problem right. with a lot of firemen. <laughs> right. Uh, Ted Levine, you want to ask a question? Oh, and at the museum. museum, you've got to come when the museum gets to open again. We have a 1928 Aaron's Fox uh, pumper that was called the Rolls Royce of fire engines. I mean, these things were built to last, and the one we have was in regular service for 34 years. I mean, these things were built to last forever and they almost did. <laughs> and ours is in full operation uh, if, uh, for special events and parades and things. Anyway, yeah, okay. Yeah, I, I think I may have seen it at the academy. I was down there a couple of years ago. For one of the most- a, por- yeah. a lot of ports yeah. on the front of it. Yeah, oh yeah, 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 I mean that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there's yeah. a bunch of uh, discharge ports and that. Yeah, yeah, well, it's uh, for enough for four for lines to go in, I believe. Anyway. Yeah. But, um, yeah, it's uh, it's fun. Anyway, and I've been to every firehouse in Chicago by the time I was 12 years old, by the way. <laughs> My, that's how I got to know the city, yeah. But, uh, I'll tell you an interesting thought you one. were nearby. Yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you an interesting one, Jeff. I rode with Chicago um, when I was 19 years old. I went to uh, paramedic school, and I needed to get my time to get certified. You know, I wasn't going to get it. in in So where did you go? Which house did you go to? I was at Armitage in Larrabee, Ambulance 43, and then I was at Broadway in Wilson. uh, Engine 83 and truck 22. Uh, Yeah, yeah. Ambulance 31. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, but I'm going to tell you, here's the thing. It was such a, I came home after 24 hours there in a (laughs) trance because I was in shock. I saw so much trauma in just 24 hours. Oh, in uptown. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) In uptown. And I was, I was 19 years old and I, you know, 
I saw every, I mean, I saw somebody jump, you know, somebody jump off a building. I saw a shooting, you know, we had a call for, uh, uh, probably 20, 20 bad traumas in that 24 hour period. And I just, oh, yeah. for a 19 year old kid, it was something else. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's, uh, yeah. That's, they, 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 I remember the old house that they were, but anyway, that's different. <laughs> Jeff, you mentioned the old house. Um, there was a firehouse on Chicago Avenue, uh, one of the really old ones. And I think it was my 25th birthday. I actually went there and I was allowed to You mean to Engine 98? Down. Engine 98 at 202 East Chicago, behind the water tower at the pumping station. Yeah. It closed it in 98? Engine 98. No, it was. Oh, Engine 98. All yeah. right. Was it? Is it it looked like a castle. It, didn't it look like a castle? Yes. I believe so, yeah, it was old. And, and Potter Palmer helped to build that. He, he wanted it to look like his, his mansion on Lakeshore Drive. He put money into that, yeah. On, yeah, on Chicago, we have, yeah, I think it was Chicago, east of Michigan. That's right, that's right, that's yeah. Engine 98, yeah. So it's still uh, in operation. Very much so, they wouldn't let it close. Oh, yeah. like I said, oh. I, they allowed me to slide down that grass pole, what a thrill. <laughs> I avoided that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Bill Lally has a question and then Ted Levine. Yeah. Uh, a comment, uh, actually, Catherine. Uh, it was a great program, uh, by the way. Uh, uh, my family, uh, a fair amount of uh, connection to the area. Uh, grandfather, who would have been mining in the area in the late uh, 1800s and into the early uh, 1900s, so before what we're talking about here. But then the uh, husband of my aunt uh, was a miner at, uh, at the Cherry Mine, was not working that day, uh, thankfully. And- uh, You wanna try to share second. a page? Something from a scrapbook. Oh, here it is, here it is. That uh, was written by a, uh, first cousin once removed uh, 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 talking about uh, my aunt uh, what had been passed on if that can be seen that uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. a little more uh, information about some specific names and so forth uh, uh, the uh, the name of the husband of my aunt was uh, uh, Banucci uh, James Banucci and a uh, uh, little story about uh, that uh, he did not work that day. Yeah. Uh, yeah. One other thing about where, where people uh, went, uh, if, uh, it, in my case, my family, my dad was a coal miner. So it was my grandfather that was in that area. But then my dad uh, was a coal miner in Southern Illinois. So that when the, the, the mines in Southern Illinois, became much more the prominent mines within the state of Illinois. And uh, then when that dried up some, that's when a lot of those people from the Centralia and- uh, Carbondale, Western, doesn't that come from-, from yeah, uh, Carbondale wasn't one of the, 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 oh. the specific uh, mining towns necessarily. Oh. But yes, that, that is exactly the area. But yeah. uh, West Frankfurt was where uh, the, one of the prominent names of Centralia as well here. And, and then many, many of those people came up to Highwood, Highland Park area after things became a problem down there. There was also a very significant mining disaster in the town of West Frankfurt. And I remember it as a child and a number of people in Highwood all trying to call down to find out what, uh, the status was and the phone lines were all tied up. I, I, I was very young, so I don't remember a lot of, of that detail. At all. Yeah. One last thing about the area, uh, Mayor Fidel Guinea and his wife Josie used to go down in, to that area. He had a house down there and he would go down uh, on most weekends, many weekends and, and all. And uh, in one trip where there was a, an event uh, the fire chief, uh, David Biondi, and his wife, Kathy, my wife and I, and the mayor and Josie were uh, honored to ride in a parade 
uh, there in uh, through that uh, that area. So a few different uh, miscellaneous ties there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. And Ted Levine. Has been um, yes, I realize it's not a fire per se, but how did the, um, you, you touched on the Eastland, how did that rank in terms of uh, some of the greater Chicago disasters? It was the worst single loss of life of any disaster in Chicago. The Eastland, 844 souls were died in that, and it, it never even left the dock, as, as you know. it. And do you know what? Else is interesting about that. That ship was later floated again. I heard and, that. As a naval training vessel called the Wilmette. <laughs> and during the Second World War, uh, it was again a training vessel. And um, just the, the whole idea of such a ship being refloated. Well, at least they changed the name. They also <laughs> cut it back. Yeah. Yeah, Rhoda. Dan Pierce's father, um, my father-in-law, was a young man on his way to work walking down Michigan Avenue, and there was all this commotion. It was the Eastland, and he stopped to help uh, people in the, in the way he could, whatever he could do. And he was given a day off from his work. Oh, well, this was, of course, it <laughs> actually true. happened around LaSalle Street. I'm and sorry. That July, sorry. July 24th, 1915. Right. And you know the irony of that? It was a sort of indirect connection with the sinking of the Titan. Because one of the things they learned from the Titanic was there weren't enough lifeboats. And the Eastland, which already wasn't that steady, they put on lifeboats on the top decks, heavy wooden lifeboats. And oh. so <laughs> uh, people went to one side to say goodbye to their families that were on the dock. And, uh, you know, it wasn't steady to begin with. And so it was really uh, <laughs> almost a result of the Titanic. <laughs> yep, yeah. you're right. Yeah. Because he was a lawyer. He was on his way down the oh. South Street, not Michigan Avenue. That's right. Yeah, that's right. It was off of the South. There's a there's a marker there and they have ceremonies there, uh, uh you know, from time to time. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Any yeah. other questions or comments? Okay. Well thank well, you. Well, Jeff, this Thanks. was terrific. Thanks for tuning in everybody. <laughs> thank you, Jeff. It was thank great. Thank you. Really. Jeff, thank you. Thanks, Jeff. That's terrific. All right. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you. All right. Take care, everybody. Bye. Yeah, we'll do. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye.